still, hear the sound of peace. Look up to the king, the priest. Each day, a blessing he gives to you. In your life, we live, we live with joy. We live with your voice. Anxious perspective is lost. Look up to the help at the cross. Deep breath, life and him grab hold. Live now, don't worry. We live to choice. We live with your voice. So here I am in the um, in my back garden at the moment, and uh, I just want to ask a question: What has this Nerf dog ball, this bit of gravel that I just pulled out of the soakaway around the house, and this cellar tape got to do with the resurrection? That's pretty obvious to you, I guess, but maybe not. Let me explain. So. I want you to imagine that, um, yeah, this is is somebody who has never sinned, and this stone is somebody who who has sinned. So what happens is, when that person dies. One person bounces back up. <laughs> Very good. Bounces back up. Whereas the other person doesn't. So you got the one that bounces back up because the power of sin doesn't have any power over this person. Whereas the person who doesn't bounce up, the power of sin. Is completely in control and so they are captive to death whereas this person has come back to life because sin has lost its power death has lost its power over this person because this person has never sinned so okay Jesus is the only person who's never sinned I know that I am a person who has sinned so I know that when I die that's what's gonna happen to me but this is where the sellotape comes in. What if I joined myself to Christ, or if Christ joined himself to me? What if he, the sinless one, kind of attached himself to me, or I attached myself to him? What if we attached ourselves to each other? I believed in him, and he died for me. Suddenly, I've kind of cheated death, haven't I? Because by rights, the power of death should hold over me. But because Christ hasn't sinned, when I'm one with him, which is another way that the uh, New Testament talks about what being a Christian is, united with Christ or in Christ, suddenly when he is raised from the dead, I am raised with him and the power of death has been broken. 
you reckon? John chapter 20. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter, who was behind him, arrived and went into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the burial cloth that had been around Jesus' head. The cloth was folded up by itself, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from the scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes, but Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white, seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned round and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realise that it was Jesus. Woman, he said, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned towards him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, do not hold on to me, for I have not yet returned to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am returning to my Father and your Father and to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news. I have seen the Lord! And she told them that he, that he had said these things to her. Let us pray. Father God, we gather on this Sunday morning in unusual circumstances, scattered across our district. But we realise, Lord, wherever we are, whether we're in this part of North Wales or anywhere, in the world. Those who love you are a part of your great church. We are your children. We thank you that we're united by your Holy Spirit living within us and we praise you for that great truth. We come before you on this, uh, this Easter morning Lord and normally we would gather and take bread and wine this weekend to remember the great events of the past, the great events of salvation of your love for us shown by sending the Lord Jesus who lived this perfect life and died this death on a cross but who rose again triumphant defeating death. We thank you Lord that we as your people um, have our lives safely in your hands whether they be long or short you've promised to love us and to look after us. We thank you again this morning that you're a God who forgives. You forgive the sins that we've committed in this past week in thought and word and deed. And we thank you, Father, that as we come before you, we have this great privilege to call you the creator of the heavens and earth, the sustainer of all life, to call you our Father. And we come before you as your children. Lord, we come before you with many needs at the moment. We find our community and country and indeed world in a period of great crisis as this horrible virus spreads across the land, causing, causing misery and death and anxiety and fear. We bring before you, Lord, this morning those members of our government and the advisors to our government who are suffering from this illness. And we pray, Lord God, your healing upon them, yes. We pray, Lord, your wisdom to be given to them, Lord, that they may direct 
uh, the resources of this country in the right way to bring an end to this this so terribly difficult period. We pray for those of our fellowship, Lord, who are poorly uh, in differing ways, Lord. Sometimes we don't even know and we pray for your hand upon them, your touch and your blessing and your healing. Father, as we look into your word, we pray, Father, speak to us, change us and draw us near to you. We really want to be near to you this day. Bless us, we pray. We also, Lord, remember today those of our fellowship um, who are scattered across the world, working for you in different corners. Bless them, be near to them. You know the difficulties they're suffering. They'll be different from ours. And we pray your blessing upon them. Amen. Whilst the world's in turmoil, where do we turn? Where does our help come from in our deep concern? From the strangest places, deep in the grave, our help comes from God's Son. He came here to save. Strange to place hope in the death of a man who legibly rose like no man can. And yet he was raised, hundreds can prove. Foretold, the stone removed. The Savior died for me, conquered death, rose to life to set me free. of trouble are hard indeed that I should not fear them for I am freed I'm freed I'm freed for I am free popping up in the background there that's Andy, my neighbour. Uh, he's just lent me a stepladder to um, put my computer on top of uh, so that I could uh, organise myself to do a bit of a recording out here. Why am I out here uh, in my street um, this morning? This is Easter morning and I'm bringing you this morning's sermon. Well, the answer is quite simply that we've made a decision that uh, we are going to start broadcasting from home that the situation has come to a point where going into the church and doing our recordings isn't essential uh, it was important wasn't it at the beginning to have a familiar place but now really you know you've got the familiar face and even if it wasn't me somebody else it's a familiar gospel a familiar word and we're, we're all right as a church we're getting this aren't we we've been so encouraged by the incredible support that we've had from all of you who've been watching uh, the videos that were coming out. We're getting so many people subscribing to the YouTube channel now. We've had uh, so many people watching the films. We've had so many people putting their likes on there, sharing it with other people. We are, I can't tell you how much this has meant to us. We were so concerned that this situation was gonna you know, scatter us, but in fact, our numbers are growing. We realize that we've got you know, hundreds of people People we don't even know and if you're out there watching this this morning this Easter morning uh, and you're not a ring, regular member of our church we want to thank you for watching uh, we want to trust that you know the Lord Jesus and if you don't that our ministry here will in some way help you and um, 
Usually at this part of the service, we try to say something from God's Word and bring something out from the uh, from the Bible itself. And uh, that's probably the first lorry I've seen, uh, although it's been so quiet around here. Uh, the reading that Alison brought to us earlier, um, that um, Anthony was praying that we'd benefit from, came from John's Gospel. Uh, John uh, chapter 20, in fact, starting in verse 1. And one of the interesting things about John is we've been looking a lot at John at church recently because he wrote the book of Revelations, which of course talks about extraordinary events happening in the world. And we feel in some sort of way that, uh, you know, we are living through extraordinary times and we've been prepared by the Lord. Uh, we wanted to continue to serve him even through difficult times like this. And, we, and that's what we're endeavouring to do through this. But John also wrote a gospel. He wrote an account of Jesus' life. And uh, I... I was reading in the 20th chapter, which is John's record of what took place um, on, on the day that Jesus rose from the dead, uh, on that incredible Sunday morning, that Sunday morning that has changed history, uh, it's changed the world, uh, it's changed millions of people's lives, it's changed my life and uh, many, many of the people who have been watching, I'm sure you uh, perhaps out there, uh, you, you've had your life changed by, by what took place on that extraordinary first day of the week as it says in John chapter 20 verse 1 early on the first day of the week that's how he begins his account um I've entitled what I have to say as life after lockdown life after lockdown and there's obviously a, a reason why we're talking about lockdown uh, here we are and what's normally a busy little cul-de-sac and we're all uh, locked in and, and at home uh, and the rest of it I'm just here outside the front of my house uh, staying within the perimeters um, and, uh, and the reason I want to bring our, our experience here into what we're reading from John 20 verse 1 is because if you were going back to that day that that early that on that first day of the week you have a people who've been in lockdown and they're really I think we could just just to put a bit of background into the passage uh, obviously Jesus has been locked down hasn't he Jesus has been uh, uh, very much a, a free public figure uh, gathering crowds of people you know people flock to him they came he came into the open he came into Jerusalem riding on a donkey uh, he which was a, an, a sign of him coming into the city as a as a as a, as a king of peace to the city uh, and people flock to him and big crowds it was very much a uh, a figure at large and a figure at liberty and then suddenly he's in chains suddenly he's under arrest suddenly he's contained uh, in a cell suddenly he is being locked down and, and he's not able to speak for himself to the public to his crowds to his disciples to his followers but instead uh, now he's been uh, spoken about by the authorities they are declaring about him uh, he's no longer able to represent himself in that sense but in public in the public domain He's uh, denounced as a blasphemer, uh, denounced as, a, as, a, as an ungodly person, a person worthy of death, even the worst of death, somebody who should, should be crucified. So we, Jesus has been locked down, hasn't he, in, in that sense, and taken away in the worst of possible deaths to public humiliation, subject to ridicule and, and uh, uh, so many cruel words and unkind words spoken against the man who'd done nothing, the innocent man. Jesus, the sinless, the sinless King. Uh, but there it was, Jesus got locked, and, and with the locking down of Jesus, the, which ultimately uh, was it the locking him away behind those stones in the tomb, uh, there he was, locked away in a tomb, um, the ultimate lockdown. But having been locked down, the consequence was for the lockdown of all the Christians, all the people who followed Jesus, um, suddenly found themselves uh, tarred with the same brush. You remember Peter, he, he was uh, pointed out in the crowd as being somebody who'd associated with Jesus. And, and now he, he's kind of ashamed. He's lying. He's, he, he's not being open about his faith or his relationship with Jesus. Uh, he's kind of been locked down, as, an, as are all the other Christians. You, you see, on the first day of the week, uh, before they began to realize that Jesus really was alive, that the Christians were hiding behind closed doors. They were worshipping uh, away, uh, just kind of licking their wounds. We thought that this man was the saviour. All their hopes, their dreams, everything's been locked down. They're afraid. Um, and 
and and so consequently uh, not just Christ but the Christian church these Christian followers they, they've been locked down um, and are in hiding the, the third element of the lockdown is this that Christ was crucified on the Friday uh, he rose on the Sunday and on the Saturday which is the Sabbath uh, there was an enforced lockdown too because the Sabbath nobody is allowed to go out nobody is allowed to come in and go that's the, the nature of the Sabbath so Mary who we're reading about in John chapter 20 verse 1 wasn't allowed to go out even to tend to Jesus's body he was uh, uh, he, he was locked away in the tomb she was locked away because she was a Christian and when finally the Sabbath was over um, she, she'd spent the last 24 hours not even able to go out the 200 cu 2,000 cubits distance to where Jesus' body was to tend to his body because of the lockdown. So imagine the situation, everything's in lockdown. And ironically, um, this lockdown is taking place at, at the time of a great public festival. So everybody's having a wonderful time uh, during the Passover or at least some people were. Perhaps actually I think the truth was that that Passover, there was a shadow over the Passover, wasn't there, of, of what had happened to Jesus. Maybe some people were really pleased and, and rejoicing about it, some people were feeling guilty and uneasy, a real subject of conversation around people's meal tables, uh, and perhaps a, a shadow over what would, should be a, a celebration. But So there's a sort of sense of oppression and guilt um, and rather wicked rejoicing, if I can put it like that. The Passover is normally a joyful festival, but this Passover, this particular occasion, was a very conflicted and locked down affair. And the Sabbath locked everybody in together. All the pilgrims were in the city of Jerusalem together, locked in together. Christians, non-Christians alike, all locked in, compacted together in a real uh, intense situation. Well, there it is, there it is. That's the, 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 the lockdown. But of course, the lockdown comes to an end uh, on that first day of the week. Chapter 20 and verse one of German's Gospel. And we read on the early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark. So here's Mary in the dark going out and she's putting her foot out uh, of the front door for the very first time. Uh, she's gonna, she's gonna venture out. She's going to, uh, as it were, uh, step out into the dark, step out into this new day. So we've we've got these these three, uh, this this sense of um, the, this Jesus has been locked down, the Christians have been locked down, the city has been in lockdown, and and Mary is on the move for the first time. Somebody's on the move. Um, uh, so chapter twenty verse one, early in the first day of the week. Now, the writer John. Who had known and loved Jesus? Um, he he uh, he was somebody who was. If you look at his writing, one of the books he's greatly influenced by is the first book in the Bible, the book of Genesis, Genesis uh, chapter one. If you remember, it, it says in verse two that there was darkness on the face of the deep, and the spirit of, of the Lord was hovering over the dark in the darkness. So everything was in sort of darkness and confusion, and you can see there's a sort of mirroring of that darkness and confusion at the dawn of creation before God said let there be light that that John is almost mirroring that 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 first day in the darkness stepping out of a lockdown um, is a sense in which like the spirit is there the spirit is present but it's dark and it's confusing and disordered everybody's in a you know imagine what kind of a state Mary must have been in I mean she the person the man she loved that you know not in it as, as, a, as her savior as her lord uh, the person who'd forgiven her so much, given her acceptance and worth and meaning in her life, um, after all the condemnation and judgment she's experienced with so many people, um, he's dead, and she, she saw him die. They all saw him die, and, and seeing him die, so something died within them. Um, and here she is in this crushed, broken, confused state, parallel to Genesis chapter 1, verse 2. Darkness was on the face of the deep. And, and, and the deep in that sense is like of her spirit. Her spirit is darkened. The, the Christians were in this dark place. The city was in a dark place. Um, Jesus had been in this dark place, the, 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 the tomb. Uh, and then, of course, you know what happens after that, uh, that verse. As soon as we had uh, the darkness, um, then it says in the beginning of verse 3, and then God said something. Uh, and you'll all know perfectly well what it was uh, that God said. This is so funny, isn't it? Because honestly, this 
Hold a sec, it's never been this busy and soon as I started recording this, it's like everybody's on the move, but that's by the by. So darkness is on the face of the deep, and John is telling us in chapter 20, verse 1, that while it was still dark, he's making a parallel there to what we've got. And he, so he's using the darkness as a metaphor as well, isn't he? For a spiritual darkness, the sort of darkness of death, the darkness of fear, the darkness of mourning, if I can put it like that. But there's, but there's one use of uh, darkness, one metaphorical use that I think he is particularly emphasising, and this is what I want to make sure that, that we understand. And that is the darkness, and it's a very deep darkness, the darkness of ignorance. And just to, just to say something about that, we'll come to it in a minute, but the thing about ignorance is that ignorance is not a lack of knowledge. You see, when people have been told something, they, 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 they have access to knowledge, but they push that knowledge away. They deny that knowledge. They, they, they uh, reject that knowledge. That's what ignorance is. Ignorance is not not knowing something. Lots of people just don't know anything. Uh, it's, it's, the, it's why they don't know it. It's because they've actually pushed away the opportunity to know something. They're shutting out some information or some facts they don't want to know. That's what ignorance is. When somebody's behaving in an ignorant way, uh, they could be behaving in a different way. They could be acting in a different way based on knowledge that was made available to them, which they've actually dismissed or rejected for, for whatever reason. And that I think here there is a sense that Mary is in, in there's this dark, the darkness of ignorance, and I'll talk to you about that a little bit more in a moment. But, but basically there, there are three things here. There's the darkness of, of, of death, really and, and mourning that's pretty uh, obvious and I just want us to think about this for a minute uh, while it was still dark she she what she's going to go and do she's going to go to to Jesus's tomb and she's going to go and dress the body I, I, almost certainly the Roman soldiers would have uh, turned her away if, if of course they weren't there she didn't know that but they, they weren't there she perhaps she should have known that but they weren't there if they had been there she'd have gone there uh, to try and gain access to the tomb but it was sealed and nobody was going to be allowed in so she probably would have been turned back uh, what else would she have done maybe she would have sat down there at a distance and prayed or cried or sobbed or something like that maybe she'd have made a little wreath of flowers or something like that and left it there i i, I don't know but perhaps uh, as the day went on other people might have come and gathered around at a distance the soldiers would have stood there as guards and the dead body of jesus inside the lockdown tomb and people around would have started to gather and perhaps the, the following day some more people would come and that that place could have become a bit of a shrine couldn't it a bit of a, a sanctuary somewhere people would have resorted to to, to remember Jesus oh, all the lovely things that he did the miracles he did the wonderful teachings he did uh, the help and the comfort he was but it's all shrouded in a sort of morbid uh, retrospective uh, sadness and, and darkness a darkness of spirit so much religion that is like that so much religion in fact there is a building built over the place where Jesus' body was laid Jerusalem today um, it's called the church of the holy sepulchre and it is the most bizarre place with all sorts of um, ancient christian denominations that are meeting there catholics orthodox all sorts of things competing for space all based around this the place where Jesus' body was like a, you know sort of almost a morbid a, a, assembly around uh this the, the place of death of um or where he was you know the, where his body was uh, you get that in rome as well the, the, in uh, the basilica st peter's basilica in rome i mean there that's all built over the tombs the catacombs where the early christians used to come and worship because peter's body was laid there uh saint peter so like you can see that the whole of that beautiful basilica is sort of based around uh, a tomb, a morbid tomb. Jesus talked about how some of the Jews in his day, you know, uh, kind of made these pilgrimages to the shrines of the prophets, uh, to, the, to, the, to the tombs of the prophets. And to this day, some of the, the rabbis have tombs in various parts of Europe and people go there on pilgrimage as if to pray there, as if something special happens there. I've heard stories of Christians who've gone to kind of go to... The, the, the tombs of, uh, of famous Christians and to somehow absorb some positive, I don't know, whatever. But, but you know, there's something macabre about that. There's something morbid about that. Something not of life, but of death. Something backwards looking. Something 
nostalgic, some inability to, to, to live life as it is now, but kind of stuck in the past. And you, you see that with a lot of religious peoples, don't you, where their clothing, their attire, they seem stuck in the past, as if religion holds people back from engaging the now and the future. Um, and I suspect that as if Mary had, in Mary's heart, as she went out in the dark on that first day of the week, in her mind, that's sort of where religion is going for her. She's kind of going to a tomb, uh, a sad place, a retrospective place, a place of, of commemoration and memory um, and thankfulness in, in hindsight and all the rest of it. But ultimately sort of still shrouded with this kind of nostalgia, which I think is, is actually quite contrary and counterproductive to life. But the, the other side is, is the fear. Um, why people kind of like um, the, the darkness of fear is, is that um, the, 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 the death of Jesus was a very terrifying thing. It was meant to terrify people. They crucified Jesus to warn his followers, to warn others not to follow his example and not to be like him, to put people off, to set people back. And, you know, these kind of measures, fear is very, very powerful. I don't think we should ever underestimate how... Um, how deeply pervasive fear is, and especially the fear of death. Um, at, at times like this, you can really see with everything that's going on in the country and around the world, how uh, potent the fear of death is. And, and you know, there's a, there's a legitimate, uh, wise kind of fear, isn't there? You know, we shouldn't want to die. Um, but, there, but at the same time, there, there is a kind of a, an irrational fear, a kind of the one thing in life that I can't really control, I can't do anything about, it's inevitable, it's going to happen, um, it's frightening, I don't know what stands beyond it. Um, if, if Jesus can die, you know, the great Jesus, the great teacher, the great healer, if, if, if he can't overcome death, then what hope do we have? And the truth is that people all around the world have got a kind of, um, they, they cope with it in different ways, but a lot of our neurotic behaviour, our aggressiveness, our defensiveness, all stems from ultimately a kind of sense of fear, a vulnerability that we feel. Why? Why do we feel vulnerable? Why do we feel weak? Because, well, because we are. And that's a frightening uh, thing uh, to, to address. You, know, you see, in lots of culture, people... Uh, you know, like the shoot 'em up um, games where you kind of get into a war and then you get killed, and kids do it when they're little, don't they? They play war and they're rehearsing death, or, or kind of, or, or contrary to they're completely avoiding death. They try and shut it out. They want to think about it and so on. But in all of these things, what's there is this this shadow of death. Isn't that in the Psalm, 23rd Psalm, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will not fear, for you are with me. But the truth is, lots of people are walking through the valley of the shadow of death. That's the whole of their life. There's this shadow over it. And it's like that religion, a morbid religion, the religion of fear, that's kind of, kind of, doesn't solve that problem for people, doesn't resolve that problem for people. Uh, they still live under the shadow. They're still bound by the power of death if you think of it like that. But, but what I really want to talk about is, is this third point, and, and that is um, the darkness of ignorance. You see, Mary, and, and, and I don't think John is picking on Mary as if she was particularly ignorant, the fact that she's perhaps more um, bold to go out and discover and find out what this first day of the week holds for her uh, than the others. Although we do know some of the other women also went out on that first day of the week up to the tomb. Um, but, but, but the point is that she's going out, she's been unhappy, she's going to anoint her body, she's, she's in mourning, she's in darkness. The truth is, she's, she is, and I, I mean this with the greatest of respect to somebody whose emotions are real and one has to be sensitive to the reality of other people's feelings. But they are wholly inappropriate emotions because out there in the darkness, un, outside of her consciousness, Jesus actually is not dead. Um, Jesus, well, he's alive. He's alive. And and the thing is about Mary and the other Christians is that Jesus had told them and told them and told them and told them and told them that he was alive. So here they all were, 
behaving as if he was dead and locked down in the tomb and them locked down with him in the tomb and this kind of sense of curse and guilt on everybody and this awful situation but actually Jesus was alive so so and she she'd been told that by Jesus by the very person who every time he said something it happened this this is Jesus of Nazareth who would who would say to a blind man you know eyes open and and his eyes would see he would he would raise the dead at a word the, the Jesus's words are apt, so reliable but there is absolutely no way on earth that could be any doubt that when he said, I'm going to rise on the third day. But they just the truth is, it's not that the word wasn't there. What wasn't there was the faith. They just didn't believe it. They didn't believe it. Here's Andy back to my neighbour, bless him, who lent me the ladder. Just let him park his car for a minute, shall we? We're getting on to my third point there. <laughs> this is the most unusual sermon, right? Unusual situation for a sermon. But here he is. Here she is. She is ignorant, walking in darkness, when in fact the Bible says that God's word gives light. Now, God's word, the words of God through the mouth of Jesus. <laughs> God's word through the mouth of Jesus. There was all the light she needed. There was all the light all those early Christians needed. He'd said he was going to rise on the third day. And this was the third day. And they had every reason to hope that what he said would indeed come to pass. They, they, they were afraid. They were, they were mourning. They were in shock and disbelief. They were in a terrible state. But actually, truthfully, they really needn't have been. They, they, they could have been in faith and hope and expectation during that lockdown period. They could have been excited. They could have been expectant. They could have been anticipating what was going to happen on the first day of the week. Because God said, let there be light. And Jesus said he's going to rise from the dead. And they could have been just kind of waiting. But what we see is, is there anything about that's just that faith is so absent, isn't it? Now, I, I know it's a big stretch to expect somebody's going to rise from the dead after three days. Don't get me wrong. But after they'd seen the things that Jesus had done, Anyway, that the, the, there is nothing worse than ignorance. And, and the gospel has been preached throughout the world. And there are millions and millions of people who have been told that Jesus is alive. They're still living their lives in darkness. They're still living as if he's dead or, or never existed. Now, and that is rather like the situation we see Mary is in at this point. Where she, she it's the first day of the week. And instead of hope and expectation and faith we see sorrow sadness heaviness darkness unbelief fear morbidity a kind of morbid kind of form of religion but you know jesus isn't having that is he he's just not having that and, and as we look through the passage you've got the bible passage in front of you, uh, you you'll see the effects of this ignorance on the way that mary behaves uh, she comes to the tomb. Uh, there are no soldiers. The sun's come up now. There's natural light all over the place, but she's still not getting the spiritual light of God's word in her heart, is she? She's saying, oh, what have they done? What have they done with our, my Lord's body? And she's not connecting that the reason the tomb's empty is because Jesus has got up and is alive. She's thinking, oh, oh I know he's dead, so there must be another reason. They're looking for other explanations. That, oh, they've taken him away or blamed somebody. Or da -da 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 rather than just believing the words of Jesus Christ. Uh, you get down to verse 9, and she's talked to the other disciples, they've checked out, the, the tomb is empty, his grave clothes are all uh, aside, uh, and it says, and they still didn't understand what the scriptures said. You know, it wasn't just that Jesus said it, but Jesus had been pointing out that this was what the whole Bible had been saying was going to happen to the Messiah when he came. So, it, you know, the whole... What they say they believe and what they actually believe, you can see there's a huge gap. And there is something called the gospel gap, isn't there, between what we profess to believe and what we actually lay hold of in our lives 
uh, and realize in our lives and live in the good of it and live in the light of it. They're not living in the light of God's word at all, are they? They just don't understand it. They're looking for another explanation. Of why is the body gone? Why, you know, what's going on here? Rather than just looking to God and saying, what is going on here? Oh, Jesus said he'd be right. Maybe he's alive. You know, God said that he'd, he'd be right. Maybe that's what's happened. <laughs> they still didn't understand and then verse 14, I can't believe this, but verse 14, she ends up standing in front of Jesus. She, she meets Jesus and he's standing there. This is somebody she knows really, really well. Who's told her that he's going to meet her on this day, probably in this place, right? And she's standing in front of him and she, what's it say there? Look in the verse 14, it says, and she still didn't recognize it. It's amazing, isn't it? When you've got your blinkers on, when you're so blinkered, when you don't believe something, even if all the evidence is telling you to the contrary, you won't believe it because you only allow information in that confirms you in your opinions and in your belief. That's, that's the whole basis of ignorance, isn't it? Where the only information you're kind of allowing in is the information that tells you you're right, what you think is right, your opinion is correct. Even if you're completely off base and you, you're complete, even if you're standing in front of Jesus, you're still saying, he's dead and I'm sad. Instead of, he's alive and I am absolutely thrilled to bits that there is life after lockdown. Right? It's amazing, isn't it? But then I love the way, and we're going to finish up with this, I love the way that Jesus unpicks this whole situation. <laughs> Why are you crying? He says to her, verse 15. Why don't you? Let's ask ourselves that. Why am I crying? Why do I get upset? Why do I get downcast? Why do I? Why do I? Why does darkness come over me? Why does? Why do I get depressed? Why do I get anxious? Why do I worry? Why do I get angry? Why do I get bitter? Why? 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 What's, the, what's the Jesus asking us and Mary and all of us this question? Why? 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 When He's alive and our sins have been forgiven and there's hope and there's heaven and a future. You know, what's the problem? And we know what the problem is. Looking at it in the cold light of day, it's, it's our lack of faith, isn't it? Our, and and right, rightfully, rightfully, he would just leave us in the dark. He'd just leave us in our ignorance, leave us to our sorrows and our miseries and our self-inflicted faithless activity you know oh it's all very religious but it's very disconnected to the truth uh, and he right by rights he could leave us there couldn't he <laughs> and I, possibly one of the most beautiful uh, words in the bible uh, we encounter then in verse 16 he just says one little thing doesn't he he just he just says her name uh, oh i would love to have heard it the way he said that name, Mary. I don't know if he said it like that, you know, but there's such warmth in that. There's such uh, acceptance. He calls her out on all her stupidity, on all her ignorance, on all her misplaced sorrow, on her misplaced fears, and reminds her that he knows her, he sees her, he recognizes her, he accepts her, he loves her, and in that love is all the forgiveness she needs for her sin and, and her sin is, is dark and large like all of us we are sinners and it, sin is dark and it needs forgiveness and Jesus in his love and compassion provides it in such wonderful abundance perhaps you have had the experience of of having Jesus call your name uh, have you ever know what that is to experience him calling your name I remember when he called my name and he calls my name all sorts of times over the years Ben Ben, Ben, you know, bringing us back to the light, back to the truth. He's alive. Everything's all right. Our sins are forgiven. There's a future. There's a hope for all of us. It's Easter. Rejoice. There is one thing at the end, isn't there? At verse 17. So how are we going to live now? the light of this of the resurrection how, how are we going to 
go and tell your brothers. That's what Jesus told Mary. Go and tell them. Go and help other people who are living in the dark to see the light. Give, give somebody else a, a, a healthy, helpful, loving, warm encouragement uh, to see things as they really are. People lift their eyes up, lift their spirits up. At a time like this, when people really are in lockdown, as ever, we need the gospel. We need the good news, don't we? We need to remember Jesus, Jesus Christ is alive. Are you, are you still in the dark? Are you still in the dark today? I really hope and pray, you know, I pray that the light of the resurrection, the joy of the Lord, is your strength today. And uh, the lockdown is over. The, the great lockdown. Not this one. That will be over. The, the great lockdown is over. Jesus is out of the tomb. Christians are free. You know, we have entered into a liberty, a, a wonderful liberty. Uh, death has no power. Sin has broken its power. Uh, Jesus is alive. Life after the lockdown. Well, look, our time's up. It's talking for about 30 minutes. And Alina has uh, prepared a song. It's a really old-fashioned song. Um, and she sings it brilliantly. And um, But just look at the words, read the words, sing along, let your heart rejoice. Um, and when we finish that, uh, we're, we're going to be wrapping up, uh, meeting on our, in our Zoom groups, meeting in our house groups, keeping fellowship, keeping each other encouraged, keep loving each other, loving our neighbours, uh, enjoying life, all the gracious gifts that he gives us every single day. And when we get dark, and we, it happens, praying for each other, lifting each other back up again, back into the light, back into the truth, to hear the wonderful sound, the name of Jesus, calling us each by name.